Mike, for you too. I'll just give this out to you first. But then uh, last week we were talking about Mary, but we wanted to give you something. We ran a little bit short, so we didn't do that. So I'd like for you to turn in your Bible to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verse 21. Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. And uh, we all say that Mary uh, was a sinner. Yes, she was. She uh, recognized that herself. But these two verses I would write down and put with your notes that we gave out to you uh, last uh, week. <clears throat> all right? Luke chapter 2, verse 21 to 24. Let us read that here. We find out here in verse 21, And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he, he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. The reason for that was they were looking for the Messiah. And they were hoping that their male child would be uh, holy unto the Lord or would be the Messiah. Now, to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Now, that was the sin offering. So hold your place there and go back to where it's at in the law so you will see why Mary came to offer the sin offering. Go back to the book of Leviticus in the Old Testament here and let's go here to chapter 12. Leviticus here to chapter 12. All right? Here we go. Leviticus here in chapter 12, and look in verses 1 to 4, chapter, or I'm sorry here, Leviticus chapter, I believe it's chapter 12 here, let me see if I've got the right one here, verses 1 to 4, it might be 16, let me see here, first year, okay, chapter 12, verse 1 to 4, the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, if a woman have conceived seed and born a man, child, she shall be unclean seven days according to the days of her separation for her infirmity. She shall be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of the foreskin, foreskin shall be circumcised. And she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and thirty days. She shall touch no hollow thing nor come unto the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. So she had an offering for that. Then if we go over here to verses six to eight. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. Proof that when Mary came to Jerusalem, she offered two offerings, one for the purification under there and the second one for a sin offering. And let's go on down who shall offer it before the Lord and to make an atonement for her, and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law of her that hath, been, that hath born a male or a female. Then, let's look in verse 8 again. If she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two, tur uh, two turtles or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering and the other for a what? Sin. A sin offering. Mary was going to do that because she knew she was a sinner. Absolutely. But you give it to the church there, or the Catholic organization, and she's being made out to be a god or there. You know, she ascended to heaven. She didn't, uh, 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 she took her human body to heaven. Contradicts the Bible there. Flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither shall corruption inherit incorruption. And then, uh, trying to make her that she can pray for us and forgive our sins and so forth like that and be the intercessor. But in 1 Timothy, we find out there's one God, one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. Not the priest, not the pope, not a priest, or not a, uh, a, a preacher or anybody else. Just wanted to bring that out. Now with your Bible, let's go back here to Matthew, and we'll go here to chapter 2, all right? In Matthew chapter 2, now, this is very interesting here because... We're going to get down here and then uh, go on to something that uh, uh, be sort of interesting here. Okay. Matthew here in chapter 2, like we notice in verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, when it says they were born, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that's sort of significant because it proves that nobody could have made a guess like this except by divine inspiration of the writer writing it. 
Now, when we say they're born of Bethlehem of Judea, we find out that first of all, there was it was also called Ephratah. So if you see Bethlehem of Ephratah, it was called that in the Old Testament back in Jacob's time. They're both one in the same place. But then there was another Bethlehem of Zebulon, which is about 75 miles north. How in the world, and that's found in Micah chapter 5 in verse 2, where that prophecy is that he will be born of Bethlehem in Judea. How did Micah 700 and some years, 710 years before Christ, happened to pick out the right Bethlehem. And you think, man just wrote the Bible? I always get a kick out of this when they say, well, man wrote the Bible? Really? I say, well, get a pencil out and write your name down for me, will you? Good. Who did the writing, you or the pencil? Come on, fella, give me a break. You're going to tell me what happened 710 years before it comes to pass, and you're going to pick out there's two towns by the same name 75 miles apart, and you're going to pick out the one 710 years before it ever was and say this is where Christ is going to be born? I think you better start believing the Bible, amen? Sure, but I like the pencil thing there. Write your name down. Good, who did the writing the pencil? Well, the pencil did the writing, really. Well, then throw it down and put it over there and let it do the writing by itself the next time, you know. Well, I did the writing. Well, let's see you do the writing without the pencil. You know, oh boy, you're a sharp guy. You know, I wonder if you graduated from grade school, you know. Okay, so much for that, without insulting the poor boy. Okay, Matthew chapter 2 and verses 2 to 8. Here we go. And saying, here, they were looking for the king, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east, and we've come to worship him. Not Mary, but him. Then we come on down, we want to read here on down to the next uh, uh, to verse 8, because we come on here where Herod is the king. And uh, we want to find out who's behind Herod want to killing all of the children two years and old younger. I'm going to tell you who's behind it, because if you write this down and look it up in John chapter 8, verse 44, God tells about Satan who is a murderer and a liar. So anything he can do to get and to kill Jesus Christ and this baby, this was Christ born, if he can kill him, then nothing can happen. He cannot go to the cross and pay for your sins and mine. So Satan works through Herod just as God uses people to present the gospel. Satan uses his troops that don't believe the Bible to pervert the gospel. So, Satan's behind Herod, I use this old boy, and I want him to try to get a hold of Christ so he can kill him, and that way he'll never go to the cross. So let's read on down. He says here, and when he had gathered the chief priests and the scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Now this is interesting because his troops here that he's got, these are supposed to be the leaders of the people, they absolutely knew the scriptures. How do you know that? Because they say so in the next verse. Let's look. And they said unto him, He's born in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophets. So they knew. Can you imagine these guys here that are with Herod here and lying to the people and so forth, but he gave the truth? They knew the scriptures. They knew where he was going to be born. They knew he was going to be born of a virgin in Isaiah 7, 14. They knew all of this. They knew uh, that he was going to be sold out for 30 pieces of silver. How could somebody 650 years prophesy that uh, Judas Iscariot is going to sell Jesus Christ out and portray him for 30 pieces of silver. I asked a math teacher one time, give me the, uh, give me the percentage wise here of all the money and all through the millions, the trillions, the quadrillions and so forth and you pick out 30 pieces of silver. He said there's not enough figures, uh, there, there's not enough numbers to give you the percentage of somebody guessing 30 pieces of silver, and it happens exactly to this person 650 years later. Aren't you glad you believe the Bible? <laughs> I think so. You don't want to listen to some of these atheists and so forth that <coughs> deny the Bible and so forth when everything's right here. Now it's going down. He said in verse 6, <clears throat> And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, Art thou not least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, then he calls the wise men, 
And he inquired of them diligently, very nicely, what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, you go search diligently for the young child. Now the young child now is older, because Luke has him in the babe in a manger, not in a house. He's a young child now, so some time has lapsed. You say, let's go on. And when you found him, will you bring me word that I may come and worship him? Also, remember John 8, 44, Satan is a murderer and a liar. He will lie to you about anything to get you from serving Jesus Christ or accepting Jesus Christ as your way, only way to heaven. He will do anything because he is the arch enemy of Christ. It's very interesting. Let's go on. In verse 8 here, I will worship him. Now, that's sort of interesting here because we find out that Herod, and you need to know a little bit about him here. Let's go on down here to verse 16. And Herod, when he saw that he was mocked at the wise men, and was exceedingly wroth, and he sent forth and slew all of the children that were in Bethlehem, and in all of the coasts thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. This man was a ruthless, hardcore murderer. He not only slew all of the children from two years old and younger in Bethlehem, all of the coast around there, King Herod had them all killed. But you need to know a little bit about this man. First of all, he reigned for over 34 years. He had a son by his first wife named Doris, and he had a son and his name was Antipater. He had another wife by the name of Mara Amni, and Mara Amni was probably his favorite wife, and he had two sons by her, and they were Alexander and uh, Aristobulus. And if I've got that right, yeah, Aristobulus. They were put to death by Herod in 7 BC. They put, uh, he put them to death. He also killed his favorite wife, Mara Amni, prior to that. And then we find out, as the many that he murdered, this is one of the last things that he did, but he not only killed Antipater also by his first wife Doris, he also, this was his last great murderous act. And then when you read the tradition and you read the history of Herod the Great, you'll find out that he uh, died a horrible death and God just took him off of that and he said, Joseph, you take Mary on down into Egypt, which only fulfilled the prophecy because in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 out of Egypt have I called my son which is a prophecy that Christ would have to be taken down into Egypt so it all worked out and actually what Herod did to do that Christ just took Joseph and Mary and Christ down into Egypt which fulfilled the prophecy that was also given some 700 years before Christ was ever born all of these things are in here so that you'll know this Bible didn't come around because some guy just wrote it. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. The Bible, the prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So as they were guided by the Holy Spirit, just like when you write your name, that pencil is guided by your intelligence as you write it, just like the Holy Spirit guided the men who penned the Bible here. And these things are put in to show that this so far transgresses any human knowledge at all. So, this is the Bible which is God's Word. Every word of God is pure. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God. Okay, let's go on down now and look at something else here. With that in mind, what about his family? Well, Herod had, had another son, Herod Antipas, who 33 years later killed John the Baptist, and you can read that in Mark chapter 6. Then he had a grandson, or the son of Herod Antipas, he had a grandson by the name of Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I, some 14 years later, he killed James the Apostle, and you can read that in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So his sons became as wicked as what he was, and then he had a son, and he was King Agrippa II. King Agrippa II is the one that appeared, and you can read about him in Acts chapter 25 and Acts chapter 26. 
He was the one that Paul stood before. And he witnessed to King Agrippa. Chapter 25 of Acts and in chapter 26. And chapter 26 is where he really gave it. And do you have the song here, Almost Persuaded? You know, we have our song for that. Do you know where it came from? From King Agrippa's reply to Paul. After Paul had told how that Jesus Christ died, paid for his sins and so forth. He could have eternal life, give his whole testimony. Then King Agrippa said, in Acts chapter 26 and verse 28, Almost, Paul, thou persuadest me to become a Christian. But almost landed him in hell, not heaven. You're not almost saved. You either believe the word of God, and by believing you're passed from death unto life. God loved the world, gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him would never perish but have eternal life. Now, let's go on down. I'd like for you to go with me as Herod then died and said, you stay in Egypt, down there Joseph with the, the, with the child with Jesus, until Herod died. He died and brought him back. Then, let's go over to the Gospel of Luke because we have Satan using another man over here. And this is the time this happened before Herod here. But anyway, it was a time when Mary was pregnant and she was very close to giving birth to Christ. Which come over here and you begin to uh, look here in Luke chapter 2 and verses 1 to 6. Let's uh, read it here. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and linkings of David. He was to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Now the important thing is here to show Satan involved in this again. Well, let's use the king here. Let's use the taxation. They live about 75 miles away again from Nazareth there down to Bethlehem. Now you're traveling <coughs> over rough, rough country. 75 miles when you're probably, we'll say, eight, maybe eight and a half months pregnant. You're, you're ready to give birth. And you're going to have to take your wife. And there wasn't any taxis back then. There was no Greyhound buses. There was no bus service anywhere or anything. It either had to be camel, it had to be mule, it had to be something. Or walking part of the way or what, we don't know. But to travel 75 miles when you're, we'll, we'll give her the benefit of the doubt, at least eight months pregnant. Uh, how would you like to do that, ladies? What are your chances? We didn't have highways. We had rough, rocky roads to go over and through if you ever check the terrain coming down from Nazareth there. That's not the best in the world. So, Satan thought, all right, this is a good time to put the taxing in for everybody. And knowing that she's about to give birth to Christ, there's no way in the world she'll have to have a miscarriage or, or have the baby out there and, and it won't live. She'll have to do that. Satan was very much at work a lot of things that are not brought out to try to keep Jesus Christ from being born because if he was never born you would never have a way to heaven Christ said I am the way I'm the truth I'm the life and no man comes to the Father but by me you'll read that in John chapter 14 and verse 6 so here's Satan at work again well that's interesting because that's going to lead us on down to something here our enemy as we said is in John 8 44 he's a murderer and a liar now I'd like for you to go with me over to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, all right? The book of Matthew here in chapter 26, and you'll see what we're leading up to, okay? Matthew, chapter 26, verse 33 and 35. Here we go. In verse 33, Peter answered, and he said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet I will never be offended. That's good going, Peter. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee that this night before the crow, uh, the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice, three times. But, good old Peter, he comes back, he's a brazen old boy, he's got confidence in himself. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all of the disciples, We'll die with you, Lord. 
You can count on us. Well, it was a short time later, Peter denied him three times, didn't he? He sure did. Why did he do that? Well, let's go to, back to Matthew chapter 16, all right? Let's go to Matthew chapter 16 here. And notice in verse 21 to 23, okay? In 16, verse 21 to 23, here's what we find. In verse 21, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Oh, come on, Peter. He just told you he had to be crucified. Your sins are not going to be paid for, Peter, unless he goes to the cross and he dies on the cross. Well, all the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests and all of them, and uh, them, they put him upon the cross. They lifted him up, we're told in Acts, with wicked hands. What they should have said, we understand that, dear Lord. We know the prophecies back there that you've got to go to the cross, you've got to die, you've got to pay for the sins of the world. And you know what, dear Lord? We're going to be standing at that tomb three days later when you come out of that tomb and you are resurrected. We know that you're going to do it. You just told us you would. Now we're going to do that. But oh, Peter, a little faith. But he turned and he said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Who influenced Peter to say that to keep him from going to the cross? Satan. Peter? Yeah, Peter. Keep him from going to the cross, Peter. If Christ doesn't go to the cross, you're never going to heaven. It's that simple. It's that simple. So, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. In other words, you're looking for me just to set up the kingdom right now. That's what you want. You want us to take out of the... Uh, uh, hands of the Roman uh, government. You want to set the kingdom up right now? I don't want you to go to the cross, Lord. So you're thinking humanistically instead of spiritually, and you're forgetting all the prophecies that talk about Christ who's going to be crucified. Well, Peter, it's like a lot of Christians, isn't it, sometimes? A lot of lost people. They get the humanistic ideologies mixed up with the spiritual things according to what the Word of God says, and then they get themselves in trouble. Lord, I want to do this. I have a desire. I want to do it. I'm going ahead and do it. And then you do it, and then you pray for God's blessings. Instead of asking God first if it's His will that you do that. Do you have a peace about doing that? Maybe God would say no. Maybe God would shut the door and say, it may look good to you on the surface, but if you go that way, you're going to be in a pile of trouble. You've got to pay a price for that. That could happen. Happen to a lot of people. You know. That's going down. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, with that in mind, I want to take you to a couple other things that Satan does, and then I'm going to bring you right down to what he'll do in Matthew chapter 13. It's going to be sort of interesting. I think we can get this in if I talk faster. Okay. And you live, you've got to hear faster, too. You know, don't go to sleep. Is everybody awake? <coughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Uh, you can write this down, look it up for yourself. Paul wanted to go to Thessalonica. And anyway, he made a statement that's very interesting in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. He said, Satan hindered me. He didn't say how or what, but he wanted to go to those in Thessalonica and, and have fellowship with them, witness to them and so forth, and teach them a lot of things. But somehow or other, Satan got in there and did something that hindered him from going to do what he wanted to do. Another thing interesting, you'll find out in Jude 9, you want to go back there? That's the little book right before the book of Revelation. And if you don't know where that's at, thank God that you put an index in the Bible. Amen. This is Jude. You do the little book of Jude here right before Revelation in verse 9. Now he puts in here to talk about unbelievers and those that deny the faith and so forth and are reprobates and all this and that. Then he uses this to show what's behind these men, and he uses Michael, the archangel, in verse 9, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Doth not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now the reason for that, if you don't know, is when Moses, the great leader and the writer of the first five books of the Bible, known as the Pentateuch, you'll find out 
that the Jews worshipped Moses. I mean, he was their great leader. And he did. And God knew that if they knew where the sepulcher was of Moses, they would be going there, worshipping him and everything else. And God said, you'll never find the sepulcher. Nobody knows today where Moses is married. But Satan wanted it known so he could have uh, people just come and worship Moses. Even today, after all of this time, hundreds of years, thousands of years. So there was a real debate between Michael the archangel that came down, and he was disputing with Satan about Satan wanted the body buried so everybody would know where it's at. And God sent Michael the archangel to make sure that nobody knows where this body is buried. With that in mind, you might put a reference. Go back with me to the book of Deuteronomy, all right? Back to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, all right? In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, God will have his way over Satan, but Satan wants to do anything to get people to worship something other than Jesus Christ. We go back here, 34, and notice in verse 6 and 7, if you will. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth if his sepulchre, uh, we'll say, or sceptre, unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eyes were not dim, nor his natural face abated. In verse 5, so you know what we're talking about. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sceptre, or sepulchre, unto this day. That's what the battle was in Jude, verse 9. Why Mark of the Archangel had a battle with Satan over whether everybody would know where Moses is buried or not. I only brought that out to show you this. Satan wants to do anything against Christ. He wants you to worship these uh, deities and so forth and these great men of this earth and so forth like that. He just loves for you to do that. He'd love for you to go there and, oh Moses, oh Moses, I wish I knew you and you did a wonderful thing and and uh, all that kind of stuff, you know. With that in mind, go with me to 1 Peter now. I'd like for you to go in your Bible. We're moving right along. 1 Peter here, and I'd like for you to turn and go here to chapter 5 and verse 6 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 to 9. Bringing this all down, do you think he cares about you? Uh, you better believe it, friend. 2,000 years later, he's very much interested in you. He's very much interested in your life. And he'd like to destroy it if he could. And he'd like for you to put anything before Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter what it is. You're coming at a time around Christmas time now to where uh, you're going to have a lot of temptations. Families or you may have family that's not saved. But they don't care about you. You just come and join us. Forget church. You know, you go to church next Sunday. But what you sacrifice is your testimony. And Christ says, you know, put me first. Maybe you'd be a testimony to your family that you talk about being a Christian, but now let me see you prove it. I got more power over you than what Jesus Christ has. You'll never win them that way, folks. Till they see that you mean something and you have substance within what your talk says, you're not going to win anybody. And this Christmas is a wonderful time to set an example if you're a Christian and you want to win some of your friends. Christ is first. Don't lay him on the shelf or put him in the closet and then run with all the relatives and friends and everybody else just in order to please them and show them how wonderful a person you are. You can be a wonderful person, but use it for the Lord first. Then they may see something that's more important to you than they are. And that'd be a good lesson for him. And his name is Jesus Christ, you see. But let's go on, okay? We come here to Second Peter, or First Peter, I'm sorry, chapter 5. <coughs> I'd like for you to begin here in verse 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all of your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, that means be sound-minded. Be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, he walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He doesn't run by you and overlook you. He knows you very well. He knows every weakness you've got. And he's going to try to get it if he possibly can. He really will. And, in verse 9, Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing 
that the same afflictions or the same testings or hardships or emotions or trials are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Just keep that in mind. Now I want to take you to a place and give you some examples of some that have passed the test and some that failed the test. Let's go over with me, if you will, here to Matthew chapter 13. All right? This is given in a parable to illustrate a spiritual truth. Matthew chapter 13 is very, very interesting. <clears throat> one, one was lost, three were saved, and out of the three that were saved, only one served the Lord. And the other two fell by the wayside because of pure pressure. Uh, they put popularity before principle, and they vowed to exactly what Satan wanted them to. I'll intimidate you. In other words, you don't like us anymore because you don't uh, come first. And uh, But let's get down here, chapter 13, and we'll get right into it in verse 19. We'll take the first one here that's lost, all right? Chapter 13, verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. Other words... He had heard the truth, didn't give it much thought, and he used the wayside because it went right on by him. Just an earthly illustration, went right on by him. How many have heard, I remember talking to a guy across the street over here, in, this had been five or six years ago, and he was doing something. So I went over and talked to him and asked him if he knew he was going to him when he died. He says, I have my own religion. I said, well, evidently you don't think much of it. He said, what do you mean? Because you should have walked across the street and come over and told me about it. Because I know whom I have believed, and I'm going to heaven when I die. So I came over and wanted to share that with you, but whatever you got, you didn't think much of it, and you didn't care about me because you're still over here. You should have come over and told me, you know. Well, he got a little arrogant about that. He didn't appreciate that too much. But he wasn't going to, he didn't want to hear anything about anything. Tough old boy. That's, that's life. Okay? This guy's lost and went right by. He heard the truth about the kingdom, but that didn't penetrate and didn't, not really interested. He's lost. In verse 20, But he that receiveth the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon, anon means straightway, with joy, he received it. Mm, that's good. But now we look here in verse 21 and see what happens. Yet, Hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while? For when tribulation and persecution ariseth by, because of the word, by and by he's offended. That's all for him. He is, is he saved? Yeah, he's saved. He received the word. Yeah, he did. He did it in. But why did he not last there? If you'll notice, yet he hath not root in himself but dureth for a while. In other words, you know how to be saved. You were told, you trusted Christ as your Savior, but there's no, uh, uh, there's no, you never went to a fellowship with other Christians. You didn't read your Bible. I'm just bringing it down to day now. Oh yes, I trusted the Lord. Yeah, that's five years ago. Uh, but you, you know, I got, I got things to do and so forth. But he never grew. A little while and he liked it and so forth, but he never got around to grow, you grow in the grace and knowledge. You get a good Bible teaching church where the Bible is taught, then you're going to grow because you're going to learn things. Because the pastor's going to teach the Bible. He's going to teach it. You're going to learn. But if you never go to church, you're not going to learn anything, and pretty soon you're going to fade and you don't want to really go anymore. It's not really interesting. Anything that comes up on a Sunday, you're going to go... And every, all your friends are going to have you so tied up on Christmas, you don't have time for the Lord. You don't have time to associate with other Christians, be in the house of God. And I'm just using that for an illustration. It could be a many different things in your life, other than just that. Church is just one little avenue of it. Anything that gets in your way to keep you from serving the Lord is satanic. And Satan just laughs at you for being dumb enough to listen to him instead of following the Lord, you say. 
Now, we're not talking about on church on Sunday. If you have a business and you work, or you're a farmer and you work, that is different. We have men that work for the telephone company. If they get called out, they have to go. This is their living. But I'll tell you one thing. The people that we have that have to do that in this church are great witnesses for the Lord. You see. Now, let's go on down. What about him? Saved? Yeah, he's saved. He's saved, but he's offended. And he fades. He's like the one with 1 John 2, 16. Lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things came in. He didn't separate from the world at all. His friends were all the world. Didn't make any new friends. Christians. So all they talked about was, well, I'll, I'll listen to this dirty story. Or, uh, why don't you come down and have a drink with me? Well, don't you like me anymore? And things like that. I had that when I quit drinking. And, uh, of course, I've told this a thousand times, but I still get a kick out of it. But I look back and look at the looks on their faces. We had poker parties and once a month, and came my poker party time there. We'd we'd play, you know, a seven card or five card set, and then a draw, deuces wild, and so forth like that, and all that. And we had uh, a great time. And then uh, it was the drinking was causing a little bit of a problem. Isn't that right, Margie? <laughs> Okay, it's right with her. I, I'm just looking at her face and her eyes. And uh, so I thought, boy, I got three, three children, and I don't want my three kids having a drunken dad, period. So I said, it's my turn next month, Marge. So I'll overcome all my school buddies down. And uh, most of them drank, as I did. So I filled the refrigerator with Pepsi instead of liquor. And uh, with beer, usually it was beer. So that, where's the beer, Alex? Where's the beer? I said, right out in the refrigerator. They went out. Well, it's not out here. Not out here, but Pepsi. I said, that's what we're having tonight. It turned out to be a short night. That was my last time I was ever invited to the poker party again. It was the best thing that ever happened. I know a man that was, uh, I should say, uh, diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. I went to see him here a short time back. Very short time. Mm -hmm. Went back into the kitchen and uh, told him we prayed for him and, and uh, hope that he pulls through this here and he drank quite a bit. I seen two bottles of liquor right there in the kitchen. And I thought, and he told me, oh no, don't worry about that, don't worry about that. Is it because I haven't had a drink in so many weeks and so forth like that. And I thought, should I tell him this or should I just shut up because there's nothing I'm going to do? Not in this case. But he went from overcoming cirrhosis of the liver and quitting. Instead of having no liquor there, he had had a, probably a 95% chance of overcoming it. With two bottles of liquor there, and to tell me that you're never going to take a drink, he decreased to only about 5% of making it instead of the 95% he would have had if he didn't have the liquor in this particular home, you see. Satan loves him. He'll get him eventually. He'll get him probably. I hope not. And I hope he's true. But I know this from being around a lot of friends and people and, and knowing this and drinking and domestic calls as of the police department. I'll tell you what. There is no way you're going to quit when you got it in your house. There. 5% maybe. But if you want to quit, get the heck out of your house, and you'll increase up to about 95% of overcoming. Okay, let's go on, okay? Because we're just about to wind her up here. Let's go here to now number 3, found in verse 22, all right? He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he become unfruitful. Well, being unfruitful is he's not going to win anybody to the Lord and so forth. There, he's not going to do that because you, you can talk about drinking all that you want, but I'll tell you what, I know a man up north, I led him and his wife to the Lord. He got a divorce because of his drinking. He went down to Grand Rapids. He got a job in a bar down there and served there, and he tried to witness. He'd pass out heaven tracks, and they'd laugh at him, take it outside, tear it up, and throw it away. 
He had no testimony. He since went on to be with the Lord, but as far as his life's concerned, he didn't win anybody that I know of to the Lord. Nobody whatsoever. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, and I'd like for you to turn there for just a second, because you find out the love of money is the root of all evil, which some have coveted after, and left the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You have no idea. Especially if you're young and you drink, you have no idea what's ahead for you. You've got heartache you've never dreamed of. Wives, husbands, children, and if you drink, your children are going to ask you, it's all right, mommy, it's all right, daddy, it's all right, you drink. Then they go out with the wrong crowd and get killed in a car wreck, and my mother said it was all right, she drank, daddy said it was all right, he drank, and so forth. You killed your own son because of your horrible testimony, you see. So, notice what it says over here in 1 Timothy chapter 6. The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have denied the faith or left the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And notice that's in verse 10. Notice what verse 11 says. And God gives advice. And here's what he says. He says, But thou, O man of God, you're a Christian. Flee these things. Run from them. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now, we'll go to number four. Number four is one that's saved and serving. So let's go here to verse 23, and we'll close with this. In verse 23, But he that receiveth seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit. He tells other people. And he bringeth forth some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. If you're a young person, you've got your whole life 100% of it for you. If you're middle-aged, you probably got 60. And if you're an old man like I am, you probably got 30 left, you know, if you've just started at this age. You might make that application. But in closing, let me just say this. Here we are at Christmas time, and we brought this out. You're going to have temptations like you've never believed. You're going to be around people and family that uh, probably drink. Are you going to drink? just to show them that you will obey them instead of the Lord. Is that what you're going to do? You're going to have a trial. You're going to have a test. You know, what are you going to do? I will tell you this. You will feel like a million dollars, and you will feel clean if you take a stand for the Lord and say, and we're just doing that because at this time of year, and in this area, everybody just drinks, drinks, drinks. And you see a lot of heartache when it's all said and done with you will feel clean when you say, Dear Lord, I'll tell you what, I don't care if I go to my relatives and they're drinking, I'm not going to take one drink. I'd like to win them to the Lord, but I'm not going to win them if I join them. Because you can't join the world and expect to win the world to Christ because you're not going to do it. It doesn't work. Come out from among you, he separate, saith the Lord. That's not the unclean thing. I think this is a good place to stop. I just wanted to bring out just a couple of things. How that Satan worked through the king to try to kill all of those children, which he did. Then he went to Irenaeus. He was the governor of Syria. The king put out a thing. Satan worked through him to kill Christ when she was at least three months pregnant. And there. And you know what? He's just as much alive today. And he walks about seeing whom he did devour. He doesn't run by you and overlook any of your weaknesses. He walks by so he can scan you with a camera and find out any weakness and then come back or send one of his demons to approach you with the temptation so he can ruin your life. He'll do that. This is Christmas. This is the birth of Jesus Christ who was born to die for you and die for me. Amen? So, how could I not give him my best? I live for him completely after all that he's done. In for closing, me. let me just say this. If you don't know for sure you're going to heaven when you die, then the truth is you're probably not going. Because if you knew you were going to heaven, then you would be fulfilling 1 John 5 13, where Christ said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So if you don't know you have eternal life, evidently you're believing the wrong thing. 
and you don't have the assurance that God gives in the Bible, but you're trusting some other dingbat out here, which I call them there, that's giving you his philosophy or her philosophy, which doesn't mean a thing. Going to heaven or hell, I want to know what the Bible says. And God said, I loved you. The billfold represents sin. And with that sin, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So there are two gifts. God gave His only begotten Son who went to the cross and went, I'll give you His payment for your sin so you don't have to go to hell and pay for your own. God said, please, I'm not willing, Max Jounce, that you should perish. Don't go to hell and pay for your sin when it's already paid for 2,000 years ago. And I put it in the Bible so churches can't get it all screwed up and twist it around and say you got to be willing to give up your sin and all that sort of thing. The first thing, you can give up all of your sin, but you're still a sinner and you'll still go to hell when you die. And you can quit your smoking, drinking, chewing, go to nasty girls that do. You can, you can quit doing all that kind of stuff. But you're going right straight to hell. So, by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, a gift to God, not of works, least any man should boast. Max Channels, please don't go to hell and pay for your sin. If you will accept my payment, this hand represents Christ, no sin. If you will accept my payment, believe that I died for you, I paid for your sins, please believe it. And if you do, I'll take your sin and mark it paid. 2,000 years ago at the cross, because that's the payment that keeps you from going to hell. And then I'll give you, Max Jones, my righteousness. So you go to heaven on my righteousness because you can never have it yourself because you fall short of the glory of God. In your humanity, all of sin falls short of the glory of God, which is His absolute righteousness. But I'll give you mine if you'll take my payment and be my son. As many as received him, to them give you part and become sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Then you can know for sure you go to heaven when you die. And what a thrill that will be in this crazy mix up world that is Satan's world. He is the God of this world which has blinded the minds of them which believe not least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Don't you let him blind your mind but you trust the Lord and know you have a home in heaven. We thank you for joining with us. Dear Heavenly Father we thank you for today and we thank you for this time of Christmas here and uh, just bring down some things here because first of your birth here uh, you suffered on that cross a horrible uh, death and so forth, but it was a wonderful death because you were resurrected and you had to die so I wouldn't have to die and go to hell. And I thank you so much for doing that. And we just pray for each one here, dear Father, that we have a wonderful Christmas. There's going to be temptations all over the place. We pray that we'll not succumb to those, that we can be a testimony and stand up for the Lord who loved us and died for us. Our relatives don't take us to heaven. Unless we follow their example and get there sooner than we thought we would because we did something stupid, driving drunk or under the drinking and get arrested and, and pay out thousands of dollars and have to do this and that and one thing or another. But dear Lord, each one of us shall give account of ourselves to, to the Lord. It's no skin off of my back if you drink. It doesn't mean a thing to me. I don't think any less of you. It's just see what the Word of God says. Are you going to be one of the three that's going to serve the Lord? Or are you going to be the other two that drop by the wayside because you'd rather be popular? that have principles in your life. Dear Father, bless each one of us. We can use these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.